I'm Cindy Kelly. It is Monday, February 6, 2017. We're in Santa Fe, and I'm, I'm interviewing the historian John Earl Haynes. And my first question is for you to say your full name and spell it. John Earl Haynes. Uh, Haynes is spelled H-A-Y-N-E-S. Mm, what was going on in the 30s and 40s that, that uh, with respect to the Soviet uh, infiltration of the United States and and how they happened to fasten on the atomic project? Well, Soviet espionage in the United States started, um, there were some in the 1920s, but it was quite episodic uh, because the Soviets did not have uh, uh, diplomatic relations with the United States, so there was no embassy or consulate they could operate out of. So uh, Soviet intelligence agencies, both their military intelligence arm, GRU, um, and the predecessor to the KGB, those, at that time it was the Cheka, occasionally sent an agent over for a special project, but that was just in and out, nothing of real significance. And most of their uh, uh, interest was in keeping uh, tabs on anti-Soviet exiles. Uh, they didn't really have that much interest in the United States as a target. Um, in the 1930s, however, uh, things changed. We established diplomatic relations with the Soviets in 1933, and they established a very large consulate in New York and an embassy in Washington. And as soon as those were established, uh, both GRU, the military intelligence arm, uh, and at this time, I'll, I'll just call it the KGB because they kept changing the name and the initials change, but it's easier if you just use KGB, at least in my opinion. Uh, they established a very large uh, station in New York operating out of the consulate and a smaller one operating out of the embassy in Washington. Uh, most of their interest was initially in industrial espionage not in military espionage or political or governmental or military, but industrial espionage. Uh, the Soviet Union was undergoing a major attempt to industrialize. Uh, they felt very keenly that uh, uh, Soviet industry was technically very far behind the West, and uh, they wanted to leap forward by essentially stealing industrial secrets so that they would not have to uh, reinvent something that had already been developed in the West. Um, and over a period of years in the 30s, they developed a fairly robust um, industrial espionage uh, apparatus. Um, they also developed some sources in the U.S. government, and they had some in the State Department, uh, some in uh, the Treasury Department, and some other agencies, uh, though those really were not a particularly high priority. However, with uh, the coming of World War II, uh, obviously priorities changed. And um, there was a shift toward uh, military espionage, but even that was quite slow in 1939, 40, and early 41, uh, because the uh, Soviets felt accurately uh, that uh, while the United States was one of the world's great uh, industrial and technical powers, its military technology was, frankly, uh, not as advanced as what, you, as what you found in Germany and England, for example. However, once we entered the war at the end of 1941, all of that changed because American resources went into a very rapid military industrialization, and our technical uh, talents uh, and uh, uh, abilities in industrial and scientific areas were shifted over toward military ends. Uh, with that, uh, uh, military espionage became an extremely high priority uh, to the Soviets. And very early, uh, atomic um, uh, questions came to the fore. Uh, the Soviet Union's uh, first knowledge of atomic bomb projects probably came from England. They established a, a source uh, in the sources in the British atomic program, which started more than a year before the American program, quite early. Uh, one of their biggest sources was a man named John Cairncross. Uh, he was a secret member of the British party who had been a, a Soviet uh, spy since the mid-1930s. Uh, 
1940, he was the personal secretary to uh, Lord Hankey, a member of the British cabinet, who chaired a, a, a committee which supervised the British atomic program. And so Karen Cross, as Hankey's secretary, uh, had access to all the reports that were coming to Hankey's office, which he then passed on uh, to the Soviets. Um, in late 1941, uh, the New York KGB station sent to Moscow a report. It didn't really quite know what to do with it, uh, but of course it reported it, which was that a, um, a medical doctor in New York, who was a communist, had reported to them that a physicist um, he knew at Columbia University had mentioned to him, this was not, uh, the, the source was not a Soviet spy, he was just some guy gossiping with his friend, the doctor. Well, this uh, scientist at Columbia mentioned that um, Harold Urey, uh, one of the leading uh, scientists in the United States, a former Nobel Prize winner, uh, was going to leave shortly for uh, London with a small delegation of senior American scientists uh, to consult with British scientists over what the physicist at Columbia told the doctor, who told the KGB, was uh, a project uh, involving the development of an explosive of truly enormous power. Well, of course, the, uh, the doctor didn't know what that was about. The, KGB office in New York didn't have no, any idea what that was about, but it passed on the information to Moscow. A couple of months later, and, and by the way, uh, Karen Cross confirmed to Moscow that indeed Yuri was coming and that this was part of, uh, to meet with senior scientists of the British atomic program. Well, a few months later, the uh, KGB station in New York received a message from Moscow uh, saying that the British and the Americans uh, and the Germans were uh, rushing to develop a enormously powerful bomb based upon uh, the substance uranium U-235, and that this should become a leading priority of the American uh, station uh, in its espionage efforts in the United States. And so that was the beginning of it. And it also laid out uh, with orders to the American station um, the names of scientists that it had learned from Karen Cross, who had, uh, about the delegation that had come over, uh, some of the, it mentioned a number of the leading names of American scientists involved with what became the Manhattan Project, and ordered the uh, New York station to try to develop um, contact with them and see if any could be developed with uh, as agents. Well, there then proceeded a several uh, very frustrating years uh, for the KGB because of all the people they, they, that Moscow had initially named, they never successfully made contact with any of them. Um, uh, attempts to contact them were either brushed off or ignored uh, or uh, came to nothing uh, in the end. Uh, there were a few, um, and, and during this period, though the British, I mean, the, uh, the uh, KGB did develop uh, sources within, more sources within the British atomic program, and for a couple of years, the chief Moscow uh, source uh, knowledge about the Manhattan Project came from Britain, because uh, FDR and, and Churchill had partially merged the two programs, and they exchanged information, and of course, the, uh, the British eventually set, uh, sent a very high-level delegation of their scientists to work in the United States, including at uh, Los Alamos, as well as other facilities. Um, so uh, for a couple of years, most of the successes of Soviet atomic espionage were not in the United States. It was in, in England. Uh, there were, however, a, um, a few, um, uh, let me uh, mention to them, um, Clarence Hiskey, who was a, a, a secret communist and a chemist, was working at the Manhattan Project facility at Columbia, uh, initially for uh, uh, for Harold Urey working on gaseous diffusion. Um, he had some contact with the uh, KGB and they, they, for several years, tried to develop him as a source. Uh, he kept brushing them off, which they didn't understand because uh, he was known to them as a very ardent communist. 
Well, what they didn't know was that the GRU had gotten to him first. And in accordance with um, uh, Moscow's, uh, Moscow GRU's instruction, uh, he had brushed off any other contacts. Uh, and, uh, and this is not unusual in the intelligence world. The GRU and the KGB didn't actually exchange that much information. So KGB had no idea they were trying to recruit someone who had already been recruited by their sister and rival agency. Um, so Hiskey was, we're not quite sure when he was uh, recruited as a source. Certainly he was by 1943. He worked initially, as I said, at Columbia. Uh, then he was transferred to the Manhattan Project facility at the University of Chicago uh, and worked there. However, um, uh, the FBI had many of the scientists at uh, Chicago under surveillance. And they observed uh, Hiskey meeting with Arthur Adams, um, which is the name uh, this fellow used in the United States. He was a GRU officer, known to the uh, FBI as a GRU officer. And uh, the FBI, of course, uh, thought there was no particular benign reason for Hiskey to be meeting with um, a uh, covert K uh, GRU officer. They inform Army Security, which oversaw um, the Manhattan Project. And uh, Army Security reacted by, uh, and, and this is something that people often don't understand about uh, counterintelligence operations. Um, counterintelligence people are not really interested in arresting and prosecuting people. I mean, they do that, but they're chiefly interested in trying to stop secrets from being lost. And so the, their highest priority is not waiting until they have enough evidence for a criminal case. As soon as they have serious suspicions, they get rid of the person so that if we're losing secrets, this will stop it. Well, Hiskey uh, went as an undergraduate at the University of Wisconsin, I believe, had actually gone through ROTC and had a reserve commission. Uh, the Army had not uh, mobilized him when the war came because he was working on the Manhattan Project and that had a higher priority. Well, uh, once uh, the Army was informed by the FBI that he was meeting with a GRU officer, they changed their mind and his commission was um, activated. He became an American Army officer and was assigned to a, a Army station in rural Canada where he stayed for the rest of the war. Uh, and so that eliminated that particular uh, problem. Um, now another unsuccessful uh, approach that happened in this period, uh, 1943, um, one, uh, uh, Robert Oppenheimer in Berkeley had a number of graduate students uh, who were communists. Uh, when he entered the Manhattan Project, uh, he at some point call them together and urge them all to drop ties with the Communist Party uh, and stay away from it. Some of his graduate students took uh, that advice. Uh, one of them, Joseph Weinberg, did not. Um, and Weinberg was working uh, uh, on the Manhattan Project, uh, which was then in the early stages, of course, uh, at Berkeley. Well, uh, he uh, not only stayed in the party, once he realized what he was working on, he um, uh, went to see Steve Nelson, who was the uh, chief Communist Party organizer for the Bay Area, uh, and described what he was working on and handed over some notes and said he wanted to assist uh, the Soviet Union. Unfortunately for Joseph Weinberg, the FBI had bugged uh, Steve Nelson's house. Uh, and so uh, with that, uh, he was uh, 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 relieved of his duties with the Manhattan Project. Uh, and Oppenheimer told him he would never be employed by the Manhattan Project. Um, instead, he uh, taught Oppenheimer's classes while Oppenheimer was in, in um, Los Alamos. So that was another attempt to get into the project that failed. Uh, another 1943 um, attempt to get into the Manhattan Project, but also failed, uh, was a physicist named uh, Boris uh, Podolsky. Uh, Podolsky was a very senior theoretical physicist uh, 
He's a co-author with Einstein and uh, Rosen of a very famous article in the early 30s on quantum mechanics. Uh, but by the uh, early 1940s, he had uh, shifted his uh, work uh, to the University of Cincinnati. Um, and he, he remained very active in theoretical physics. Well, uh, he went to the Soviet embassy in Washington, asked for an appointment uh, with a, um, the ambassador. Uh, actually, the ambassador wasn't there at the time. He talked to the assistant ambassador, who immediately called in uh, uh, KGB officers to talk to the fellow. Poldovsky handed over a memorandum on uh, gaseous diffusion. Uh, and uh, indicated that he wished to assist. Well, the KGB followed up on this with several meetings, but it didn't work out well. Podolsky uh, was not in the Manhattan Project. He just knew about it from colleagues of his. Uh, he's, again, a very, he's a very senior physicist. He knew about it from colleagues, but he wasn't interested in joining the project or providing information. He wanted the Soviets to uh, arrange for him to go back to the Soviet Union. He'd been born in Russia. And he wanted a position as a leading Soviet scientist. Well, the KGB's attitude was, we in Russia have plenty of very good theoretical physicists. What we want are people working on the practicalities of how you turn the theory into an actual working bomb. Uh, and unless you're going to join the Manhattan Project, you're not for us. Well, Poldowski wasn't interested in practical experimental physics, only in theoretical physics. So that came to nothing. Um, then um, this is, uh, the KGB was continued to be frustrated, but the GRU didn't. Um, uh, they had a luck there, George Cole, uh, who was American born, but his uh, parents were communist, as, as he was. And in uh, 1932 or 1933, I forget which, uh, the family moved to Bayro Bijan, um, which was a autonomous area that Stalin had set up in Siberia as a homeland for uh, Jews. Uh, it was an awful place, but that's another story. Um, and uh, Covell, though, uh, maybe because it was an awful place, got out as quickly as possible uh, and went to Moscow where he uh, got an uh, engineering degree from a um, Soviet uh, technical school and was recruited by GRU um, as a uh, spy. He's a perfect one from their point of view and to be an industrial spy in the United States. He was a Native American, spoke Native English, no problem. So he was sent back to the United States in the late 30s um, and uh, uh, you know, he didn't have a false identity. He, he just reacquired his real identity. He had to fill in some um, you know, fa false stories to explain why he wasn't in the United States from 33 to 38 or so. Uh, and um, we don't know very many the details here, but uh, it's likely he, just, he simply worked as an industrial spy for GRU uh, during this period. Then came World War II uh, and uh, and Pearl Harbor and the draft. He was drafted. Um, now he was very technically uh, proficient. Now he didn't have on his the things he filled out for the army. They had an engineering degree from Moscow. Now that no, that was that was not talked about. But he scored very high on uh, army technical exams. And the uh, Army developed people who had those kind of skills into uh, special training programs. And so he, the Army sent him for uh, wartime emergency engineering training. I suspect it was all quite easy to, for him because he'd already studied in Moscow. Well, he did very well uh, and was assigned to the special engineering uh, detachment, which, uh, pro and this is just luck, uh, uh, he was assigned to as one of the SED um, uh, technicians to work with the Manhattan Project. Sheer luck. Um, and he was eventually sent uh, to work on radiation safety at Oak Ridge and then 
uh, at a facility in uh, Ohio, near Cincinnati, I think, uh, to work on radiation safety. Uh, so uh, he became an active source for GRU uh, all that time. And he was, he was uh, at the Manhattan Project facilities until 1946 when he was demobilized. Um, eventually, the uh, uh, GRU decided that he was um, vulnerable in the United States and he uh, they withdrew him sometime in the mid-40s to uh, Moscow. It was only years later that the FBI had any idea uh, that he had been a, a Soviet spy. Um, the KGB made numerous attempts to, uh, to approach Robert Oppenheimer, really from 1941 on, and he brushed all the, uh, the uh, attempts off. What they didn't know is the GRU had also been attempting to, uh, to uh, uh, approach him. GRU's uh, attempt was far more blatant and eventually, uh, for whatever his reasons, Oppenheimer was never very candid about this, Oppenheimer went to Army security and told them uh, that he had been approached. One of his troubles was he kept changing the story a bit as time went on. That's one of the reasons why he would later lose his security clearance is when you tell three stories about the same thing, people start to wonder which story is true. In any event, um, Oppenheimer did go to the uh, uh, Army security and say that, uh, that a good friend of his, uh, Hecon Chevalier, uh, a French professor at Berkeley, um, had essentially urged him to meet with a, uh, a communist engineer to arrange transfer of information uh, to the Soviets about the Manhattan Project. Uh, Oppenheimer rejected it, uh, the approach. Um, and uh, as he did, Every, there may be other approaches we don't know about, but as far as we know, he uh, brushed off all of them. Um, so while the GRU had actually developed a few active sources in the American project, um, Hiskey until he got sent to rural Canada, uh, and, and um, uh, Koval, but otherwise, uh, 41, 42, and 43 were just barren years uh, for as far as the KGB was concerned. Then in 44, finally, they started to have some success. Uh, and it came very rapidly. One of the first uh, successes was um, the arrival of the British delegation. Klaus Fuchs, a, a, a senior physicist, uh, a, a German exile, um, and a, a secret member of the Communist Party. Fuchs, when he was recruited to work on the British program, uh, in 1943, uh, had, um, had immediately then contacted uh, through the Communist Party uh, Soviet intelligence and was recruited as a source inside the British project. Well, uh, in late 43, uh, the Brits uh, transferred Fuchs to the United States. Um, and by the way, he was, he was recruited by GRU in England, not by the UK, but not by KGB. Uh, but when he was transferred to uh, the United States, for reasons which we don't know about, GRU transferred Fuchs to KGB control. Um, and uh, initially, Fuchs was working at, uh, at Columbia uh, University um, on the Manhattan Project, uh, their own gaseous diffusion, among other things. Um, but in February, he met with uh, a KGB agent um, uh, Harry Gold, uh, in the history of uh, Soviet intelligence, there are all kinds of stories, including some that are amusing. This is one of them that's amusing. The KGB was furious uh, when GRU uh, said, Fuchs is going to the US, we're turning him over to you. And of course, they love that part. And here's the meeting protocol. Because when you send, you know, some agent winds up at some new place, he has to be approached by a new agent. How does he know he's the right guy? So you set up some kind of protocol about, uh, so each can recognize the other and be assured that the other person is who they're supposed to be. Um, well, what the, what the, uh, uh, the uh, GRU had set up was that uh, that 
Uh, Fuchs was supposed to be uh, at a certain address in New York City on certain dates uh, and be carrying a book in one hand and a tennis ball in the other. And the uh, KGB agent who was to approach him was to be wearing gloves with a third glove in one of his hands. You know, and the KGB in its own internal communication said, we can't think of a dumber you know, protocol for a meeting. We're supposed to have a protocol that no one's going to notice. Who's going to be carrying a, a book and a tennis ball and the other guy has three gloves? But it came off all right. Um, uh, Harry Gold and, and uh, Klaus Fuchs met and uh, then Fuchs became a regular source on the Manhattan Project uh, research that was going on at Columbia. Um, well, then uh, difficulties did develop because uh, the KGB, uh, Harry Gold, the KGB agent who was uh, doing this, missed uh, because of, uh, the KGB was using Harry Gold, who's an American chemist, as their liaison agent with a number of sources in, in the industrial espionage. Um, well, he was quite overworked, and he had to miss a couple of contacts with Fuchs. Well, then he finally was able to make a couple, and Fuchs didn't show up. They didn't know where he was. Uh, what they didn't know is that Fuchs had been transferred to Los Alamos. Uh, but there preceded a number of months of lack of contact. Uh, Fuchs didn't know who to talk to at Los Alamos, and the KGB didn't know where he was. Finally, they were able to uh, reestablish contact when Fuchs visited his sister, who lived in New York. Uh, and they were able to reestablish contact, and Harry Gold would make a number of trips to um, uh, New Mexico to meet with Fuchs. Um, and of course, Fuchs was um, a senior scientist working in the theoretical division on the, uh, on the plutonium bomb. So he's a very high-placed uh, and very useful source. Um, but almost as, uh, to go back a little bit, almost as soon as Fuchs was handed over by the uh, GRU, uh, the KGB got its first really active American source, um, an engineer named Russell McNutt uh, in New York. Uh, Russell McNutt, um, who was from Kansas, um, his father was one of the founders of the um, Kansas Communist Party. and. Um, uh, Russell was a communist, like his, like his dad. Uh, he went to engineering school in uh, New York City, became a, became a, um, a civil engineer, construction, that kind of thing. Um, but as during the time of his engineering education, he got to know uh, Julius Rosenberg, who was also an engineering student, though in electrical engineering, not uh, civil engineering. But they were fellow engineer, engineer communist young students, and they got to know each other. Uh, Julius Rosenberg ran a very large industrial and scientific um, industri uh, espionage network for the Soviets. And he um, had been briefed by the KGB about the Manhattan Project and urged to find sources if he could. Um, Rosenberg talked to uh, McNutt and urged him to try to get a, 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 um, a job with uh, uh, Kellex, who was one of the big contractors for facilities at Oak Ridge. And um, he was hired and was part of the uh, Kellex uh, design team for uh, building many of the major facilities at Oak Ridge. Uh, including the massive K-25 uh, facility, uh, which uh, worked mostly on gaseous diffusion, but other things uh, as well. Um, for the most part, um, uh, McNutt worked out of the Kellex uh, Design Bureau, which was in New York City, but he made a number of trips uh, to Oak Ridge as, as they were overseeing dealing with problems that developed in the actual construction. KGB wanted him to move to uh, Oak Ridge because Kellex offered him a, a, they wanted him to move out there. But uh, he didn't want to move. Um, he had been investing in a summer resort in upstate New York. He had a family with children, 
Oak Ridge was a pretty barren place in those days. Uh, and he didn't want to um, risk losing his investment in this upstate resort. And he sure didn't want to live in Oak Ridge. So he just stayed at the Design Bureau in New York. I mean, the KGB was not happy about that, but nothing they could do about it. Um, Uh, they also, uh, but also in 1944, the KGB thought it was about to make a breakthrough at Berkeley. Uh, there was a, a chemist who was working on the Manhattan Project uh, uh, named Martin Kamen, uh, who was also a friend of Ernest Lawrence, uh, who was a senior figure in the Manhattan Project. Um, Kamen wasn't a communist, but he was very sympathetic. And the uh, KGB uh, officers act, uh, operating out of the Soviet consul in, in uh, San Francisco, um, cultivated uh, Cayman and made an approach to him. Unfortunately for Cayman, um, he was under the surveillance of both the FBI and Army counterintelligence at the same time. Neither knew that the other was also watching them. Um, and so when Cayman met uh, a guy named Gregory Heifetz, who was a Soviet diplomat who was really a a KGB officer, for lunch. Again, this is kind of one of those comic things. Uh, the FBI and the Army counterintelligence uh, surveillance teams tried to get through the, the door to the restaurant at the same time. Uh, and they recognized each other and realized they were both after the same meeting. So they agreed one, one set went to one side of the room, the other set went to the other side of the room. Um, well, they saw that came in was meeting with this guy. Uh, and uh, after that, he was promptly fired from the Manhattan Project. Uh, so, uh, and Cayman was uh, actually later asked to testify about this, and he did. And he said he met with Heifetz. He thought he was a Soviet diplomat. And he just talked about uh, some advances in nuclear medicine. Uh, nothing to do with the Manhattan Project. And for all we know, that's true. But, you know, the Army wasn't going to take any chances, so he was... Uh, he was out of the project. Um, then in October, another um, uh, source fell into the KGB's lap. A, um, Theodore Hall was a young physicist. He graduated from Harvard at age 18. Not entered Harvard, graduated at age 18. And he was clearly a physics prodigy. Uh, his professors at uh, Harvard recommended him to the Manhattan Project. I mean, they, the physicists there were you know, familiar with it, even though it's secret, but you know, they knew about it. And um, Hall was recruited to go to Los Alamos, which he did. Once he was there, I mean, he didn't know what the project was about until he got there. Uh, once he was uh, there, or in this case, once he was here, um, he realized what it was. Uh, he was also a young communist. When he went back in the fall of 1944 to visit family on leave, um, uh, he contacted Soviet intelligence. He had to go to a lot of trouble to find them because you just can't walk into the embassy and say, take me to your intelligence officer. But eventually he got through um, and uh, agreed to, uh, to work for the Soviets. I mean, he, he was a walk, he is, and since he's a walk-in, he's volunteering his uh, efforts. So um, he agreed to furnish information from Los Alamos, and his um, college uh, roommate, who was also a, a communist, uh, made the initial trip to Los Alamos to pick up information um, from him. Um, Hall was also part of the, of the plutonium part of the uh, project. So the, you know, the Soviets uh, had two sources there working on the plutonium bomb. Uh, Fuchs, a senior scientist. Hall, a junior scientist. And then a, another chance, uh, chance uh, uh, occurred that gave the Soviets a third source. Um, Julius, again, it goes back to Julius Rosenberg. He had actually recruited the first Soviet uh, source on, on the Manhattan Project. Um, uh, uh, Russell McNutt. Well, 
Julius had a, a brother-in-law, um, David Greenglass, and his wife's uh, brother, uh, who had done, had some technical training, but he wasn't that good at it and dropped out of engineering school and became a machinist. Well, the war came, he was drafted. Uh, the Army personnel system, uh, functioning properly in this case, uh, assigned uh, someone who had experienced as a machinist to an engineering detachment doing as a machinist. But then there's where the luck comes in. By sheer luck, this engineering detachment was sent to Los Alamos. Uh, and David Greenglass winds up machining models of the, you know, of the plutonium, of the trigger for the plutonium bomb, uh, for the um, implosion lens uh, that sets off the plutonium. Well, um, he uh, let, and, uh, David Greenglass, like Julius, was a communist. He didn't, you know, he probably had some vague idea that his brother was involved with Soviet intelligence, but he probably didn't know any details. Anyway, uh, he let his wife Ruth know what he was, he was involved with some big project uh, in New Mexico. She told uh, Ethel Rosenberg and, and, uh, and Julius that um, David was working on this big secret project in New Mexico. Well, Julius knew from the briefings he'd gotten on the KGB that this must be the atomic project. And so they had to first, because Julius couldn't go to Los Alamos to meet with his brother because he had already been identified to um, Army intelligence, uh, Army counterintelligence as a member of the Communist Party. And had gotten fired from one uh, electronics firm job, um, was work working on military uh, matters because of his, his party membership. Uh, and so his showing up in uh, Santa Fe uh, would have been noticed and not have worked out well. So uh, Ethel and Julius first had to recruit Ruth, uh, David Greenglass's wife, because she could go to New Mexico and meet with her husband without uh, Army and uh, counterintelligence thinking there's something unusual here. Uh, so they recruited Ruth, uh, and Ruth came uh, uh, to um, Santa Fe and met with um, her husband, uh, and he agreed to work for the Soviets. And so when he got leave in uh, late '44 uh, to go back to New York, then the recruitment was uh, was completed, uh, and and Greenglass became a uh, a source at Los Alamos. So from the Soviet intelligence point of view, for the plutonium bomb, they had a perfect combination. Senior scientist Fuchs, junior scientist uh, Hall, practical machinist uh, Greenglass. Uh, they were, one of the problems in intelligence, if you only have one source is, is this source actually providing accurate information? Is he exaggerating what he really knows? Possibly it could be a double agent feeding you false stuff. You want to have more than one source. Well, here they had three different sources from three different perspectives. It was, it was ideal. Um, and so that worked out um, uh, extremely well uh, for the Soviets. Um, now, one of the things to remember about Soviet atomic espionage, though, is there are some areas of it we know very well, either from information that has come out from Soviet archives or from uh, American security investigations and trials, such as the trials of uh, Greenglass and um, uh, Julius Rosenberg, or in, in the case of Fuchs of the uh, trial in England when he was uh, uh, revealed. And we know uh, some elements of the uh, story from decoded uh, messages, uh, cables, between uh, the KGB stations in the United States and Moscow, which were later uh, decoded by American uh, uh, cryptographers in what was called the Venona Project. Uh, and we know some things from, uh, from documents that came out of KGB archives um, a few years ago. But we know almost nothing about 
GRU operations except for a couple of snippets, and for instance, the story of, of uh, George Koval, and a lot of that uh, we're not sure how much is reliable. Um, but far less is leaked out of the GRU than is leaked out of the KGB. And we, we do know from Venona messages that have been decrypted, uh, there are cover names which we have never been able to associate to a real name. So we don't know who they are, and we don't know exactly what they did. And there may be people we just know absolutely nothing about. But uh, roughly, that is what we do know about Soviet atomic espionage in the United States on the Manhattan Project. One of the things I might mention is um, one of the uh, KGB's, as one looks, looks back on it, terrible mistakes. Uh, and I mentioned <clears throat> Harry Goal, uh, one of their chief liaisons with, um, uh, with technical sources because he, of his own background as a chemist. Uh, the KGB uh, figured uh, accurately that a liaison uh, with their technical sources who was in, in himself a technical person would uh, allow a greater rapport than if they sent a, um, I don't know, a poet or you know, someone like that. Uh, um, and uh, Harry Gold was a very effective uh, liaison for them. But the KGB got overworked and uh, they were sending Gold to um, to meet with Fuchs. I think it was his second, maybe it was third, I can't don't remember exactly. But it wasn't his first uh, trip out here, but his second or third uh, to meet with Fuchs. And <clears throat> um, at the last moment, the um, KGB uh, asked, not asked, they ordered uh, Gould that, well, as long as you're going to meet with Fuchs, we want you to meet with another agent we have there. Uh, which turned out to be um, uh, green glass. Well, that's not really a, you know, that if you do your espionage work according to a kind of theoretical uh, parameters, you don't have one liaison uh, agent uh, knowing two people who are working at the same place. That's just, uh, it's crossing wires, that uh, there are risks there, and it's better not to do it. But the, um, uh, KGBs apparently just didn't have anybody else available to go meet with Green Glass uh, at this time, so they thought they would uh, have uh, Gold take care of both of them, which he did. Uh, he met with uh, Fuchs, collected inf information from him, and then he met with Green Glass. Actually, he met with him in Albuquerque. Uh, Ruth had moved out to Albuquerque uh, and gotten a job here and had an apartment so that David uh, could uh, meet her on uh, weekends. Um, and he was, you know, the army was willing to give him weekend passes, uh, so he'd take the train down to Albuquerque, stay the weekend with his wife, and then go back to work. Um, well, Gold um, met him at their apartment and picked up information from him and took it back to the KGB. Uh, everything worked out fine in the short run. In the long run, uh, it was a disaster uh, because in 1947, or maybe it was 48, I can't remember exactly anymore, um, as the uh, American cryptographers in, well, it was Army Signals Intelligence then, or maybe even changed their name to something different, but it's, it's what is now the National Security Agency. Uh, it's the Nona Project that started to decode a number of cables between Soviet intelligence stations in the U.S., in Moscow, uh, and and a Fuchs shows up under his various cover names, but uh, uh, the FBI quickly established uh, that it was Fuchs because uh, there are only so many senior scientists working on X, Y, and Z. It was first at Columbia and then at Los Alamos. Uh, that you know pulls down the number of possibilities really quick, uh, and so they identified um, uh, that source as Klaus Fuchs. Well, but by this point, he's back in England. I mean, at, at the end of the war, uh, the joint uh, American-British uh, project was dissolved, uh, and the British project uh, on atomic uh, energy and weaponry proceeded independently of the American one. Um, Fuchs becomes a senior scientist uh, in the British program and continues to spy for the Soviets uh, in England. 
uh, the FBI turns over to uh, uh, MI5, British um, uh, counterintelligence, uh, the information on, uh, on Fuchs from the Venona messages. Because um, American intelligence and British intelligence uh, have always had a very close relationship. And American cryptographers and British cryptographers have had a very close relationship. And in fact, uh, at uh, a certain point, um, uh, the NSA brought in um, uh, British cryptographers from their program to assist in the uh, Venona project. You can actually read it in some of the decryptions of the, uh, the messages because they're, uh, uh, they're decrypted and translated into British English rather than American English. And you, you, know, you, you can see the distinction uh, quite clearly as to whose translator was doing it. Um, well, MI5 uh, took the information um, and um, decided to confront Fuchs and see if they could break him. Um, and one of their leading uh, agents uh, met with Fuchs and pressed him uh, very hard. Uh, Fuchs initially denied everything, but uh, after a couple of meetings, he broke and confessed. Um, we now know he didn't confess everything. He minimized certain areas, but uh, nonetheless, uh, it was a uh, uh, confession, particularly of his Manhattan Project stuff. Uh, he was less uh, forthcoming on what he was still doing for the Soviets in, in England, perhaps because uh, he thought that would uh, in uh, in, uh, uh, encourage the British to be more harsh in their uh, sentencing. Um, but he did uh, confess about his Man Manhattan Project work, uh, and he didn't know Harry Gold's name. He just uh, he knew him as the, um, I think he was, I don't remember exactly what name Harry uh, Gold used when he met Fuchs. It might have just been John, something like that. I just don't remember at this point. Um, but he described him physically, and he described, you know, he described fairly accurately the dates when he met him, and he described something of, of um, uh, his liaison's technical background. Well, uh, Harry Gold had come to the FBI's attention from other industrial espionage cases. It actually uh, interviewed him several times, nothing to do with atomic espionage, but with some other areas. They never found enough evidence to um, try him or charge him with anything. Uh, but he was on their list of, this guy is a, a Soviet uh, espionage uh, agent. Uh, and we know he probably worked with this person. He probably worked with that person. Uh, and when Fuchs provided the information on his um, liaison, uh, the FBI quickly decided this is probably Harry Gold. And they confronted him again with information about Fuchs. Um, Gold, this is, we're now talking 1950. Uh, Gold is, um, by this point, um, rather disillusioned about, about uh, his um, Soviet loyalties. And after denying things for a day or so, but then he agreed the FBI could search his, his residence, which they did, and found, this is Harry Gold not being a good agent here, a map of Santa Fe. Um, what were you doing in Santa Fe? Well, Gold couldn't really find a, a, a good reason and finally just broke and confessed. But among the things he confessed to, of course, was, well, not only did I meet with Fuchs, I met with this army sergeant down in Albuquerque. I don't really know his name, but he was, his apartment was at this address and so forth. Well, that didn't take much work on the FBI's part to establish that apartment had been rented by Ruth Greenglass, and her husband was an army sergeant working at Los Alamos. Well, um, the FBI then confronts uh, Greenglass and again, just took a day or two, and he broke and confessed. Uh, and of course, he identified his recruiter as his brother-in-law, Julius Rosenberg. Um, and uh, 
Greenglass realized quite quickly, I mean, we're talking about 1950 now, the Cold War is at its height, the Soviets have uh, detonated their own atomic bomb uh, years before uh, we expected them to. Uh, and uh, because uh, now that Fuchs had confessed, um, the popular view was, and the, uh, with some accuracy, that the Soviets had gotten the bomb much faster than they, than they otherwise would have because of espionage. Well, we couldn't take it out on Fuchs because the British were trying him. Uh, but here's David Greenglass. And he actually was a spy at Los Alamos. Um, and he's confessed. Well, that didn't look very good. Uh, the question just really was whether he was going to um, be executed or get, just get an extremely long prison sentence, and about whether his wife was going to go to prison as well, because she had, um, ex she had a, essentially been his recruiter, um, which would mean they would be leaving their children abandoned if both of them went to prison, unless both of them fully cooperated, which they did. Um, which led to the uh, Julius and Ethel Rosenberg. Um, so if, you know, if the KGB had not made that mistake of having Harry Gold um, uh, meet with two of their spies here, particularly not with uh, David Greenglass, there never would have been a Rosenberg case. And the Rosenberg espionage apparatus would never have been exposed. Um, so there's, that's one story. Uh, other interesting part, uh, parts of, uh, just to follow up a bit on, um, on Oppenheimer, as I said, the uh, KGB at, was approaching him really from 1941 on and getting brushed off. They kept trying all the way to 1945. Um, and they just couldn't believe they couldn't get through. And Moscow kept berating uh, its American station as, why haven't you gotten through? Um, finally, uh, uh, we have messages from the New York station back to Moscow that uh, uh, Weinberg uh, was telling them uh, it's worthless to try to approach Oppenheimer. He's no longer friendly to our cause. He's not helpful. Uh, he's, in fact, become hostile to us. And they didn't believe it until then, but finally they did believe it. Um, I guess one other point I would make is, uh, you know, sometimes I've, I've been asked, well, is the atomic bomb that much of a secret? Well, the theory wasn't, uh, and the Soviets had plenty of theoretical physicists. They had a, a project underway, and theoretically they knew as much as German and British uh, scientists and American scientists about the theoretical possibilities of a bomb. But what they gained from espionage is not the theory. What they gained from espionage was how to put it into practice. Uh, because the Manhattan Project was, you know, it was in many ways a massive engineering project. Um, and it had explored all kinds of engineering ways of doing the things they did. For instance, with separating U-235 and U-238. You know, they work with gaseous diffusion, they work with centrifuges, they work with um, um, uh, s uh, several other uh, techniques of how to do it. Um, and each of those ways of doing it, some of them worked, some didn't. Some turned out to be ex you know, massively expensive, others were cheaper. Um, the same thing with, uh, uh, with uh, the plutonium bomb, uh, about how to uh, breed plutonium or separate it or, you know, or create it in a, in a cyclotron or breed it in a reactor. All the different ways you could possibly do it, we did it first. And the Soviets learned from espionage work, what worked and what didn't work. So all of the blind alleys that we went down, they didn't have to go down. 
so they were able to carry out their project at only a fraction of the cost and a fraction of the time and a fraction of the manpower uh, that, um, uh, that ours had. So um, uh, if there had been no espionage, certainly the Soviets would have developed a bomb in time. Um, but because of espionage, they developed it much faster and much cheaper. And particularly the cheaper part is extremely important from the Soviet point of view uh, because uh, Stalin wanted to develop the bomb as quickly as possible after the war uh, to catch up with the, the United States. But the Soviet Union was, um, large parts of the Soviet Union were devastated by the war. Um, and so their ability to throw the massive technical manpower and engineering resources into the bomb project would have been a uh, overwhelmingly uh, expensive project from the point of view of Soviet resources. Uh, espionage allowed them uh, to do it at a fraction of that cost. Um, it was still enormously expensive to the Soviet economy, but uh, much more affordable than if they'd had to do it all by themselves. Also, timing is important here. Uh, in terms of the um, um, tension and vigor of the Cold War, it's one thing for the Soviet Union to have gotten the atomic bomb when Joseph Stalin is um, the head of the Soviet Union, and another if it, they had gotten it under one of his uh, successors. Uh, Stalin was, for very good reasons, a, a demonic figure. Uh, and for him to get the bomb, uh, was an extremely destabilizing aspect. Um, and it also played a role in bringing about the Korean War uh, because of the timing, because um, uh, the North Korean regime had been requesting permission to attack South Korea uh, for several years. Uh, Stalin had um, rejected the request, and the North Koreans could not invade the South without massive Soviet military support. Uh, and Stalin had said, uh, this is premature. We can't do it at this time. Uh, finally, in 1950, he gave um, Kim Il-sung, the, uh, the head of the communist regime in North Korea, permission to attack the South and um, began a massive military supply operation so that they, they could. And, uh, and Stalin, in his uh, message to uh, the North Koreans giving him permission, cites um, uh, three things that have, that have changed his decision. Uh, one, he cites the, um, uh, the success of the Chinese Communist in um, uh, taking over China in 1949. The second is that, um, uh, that the Secretary of State of the United States um, in a speech which outlined American policies in the Pacific, uh, had not included South Korea in the areas that were under direct American protection. Um, and the third thing he cited was the atomic bomb, that now that the Soviet Union had the atomic bomb, uh, uh, we need not uh, be concerned that um, uh, Truman would uh, respond to the North Korean attack by leveling North Korea with atomic bombs. But remember, Truman had used the bomb twice. Uh, so the possibility of him using it again is a, quite a realistic one. So the uh, uh, Stalin getting the bomb uh, was a contributing factor to the uh, Korean War. Groves prided himself that with his counterintelligence uh, uh, service that he put together. Um, how did they, I don't know, what were they looking at? I guess, the, and how did they miss all of this? Well, American counterintelligence uh, for the, uh, for this period, and specifically for the Manhattan Project, um, chiefly Army uh, counterintelligence was in charge of, of that. The FBI actually was, uh, it took the FBI a couple of years to figure out there was a Manhattan Project. Uh, because the army wasn't telling them about it. Um, eventually they figured out there was one uh, and that it was something they should concern themselves with and they were not 
pleased that the Army was um, uh, not keeping them fully informed about it. Um, which is why you had, you know, had Keystone Cops things such as when Army counterintelligence and FBI agents are running at each other at the door as they're trying to uh, surveil the same meeting between a Manhattan Project scientist and a, a Soviet diplomat. Um, uh, do keep in mind that, you know, as I mentioned, there, there were counterintelligence successes, uh, such as uh, Clarence Hiskey, who had been spying for the uh, GRU for at least a year or more, was finally spotted by the FBI, not by the Army in this case, but by the FBI, because they had been following the GRU officer and saw him meeting with someone, found out who that someone was, which was Clarence Hiskey working at the Manhattan Project facility at the University of Chicago, and they informed the Army and off he went to Canada. Um, uh, and you know whether Martin Kamen would have ever spied for the Soviets uh, after that meeting in uh, in San Francisco, we don't know. But he was under surveillance, and as soon as he was seen meeting with a, a Soviet uh, uh, officer, uh, he was out of the project. Uh, Joseph Weinberg uh, offered to spy for the Soviets. The FBI overheard it. He was out of the project. Um, so there are those successes. Also, as far as we know, one of the chief objects of all of the security was actually not Soviet espionage. They were concerned about German espionage. I mean, after all, we were at war with, with, uh, with Germany. Germany had an atomic program. Uh, both we and the British were extremely concerned about how far it was along. Um, we had visions that it was very far along. It was only after the war we found out they really hadn't gotten very far at all. But we didn't know that. Uh, so there was very legitimate concern that um, uh, if any uh, German uh, agents were able to get into the project, uh, they could very quickly speed up the German program and London would, be, would, uh, would have the fate of Hiroshima. Um, well, that fear was mis uh, misplaced, but um, in any case, we don't know of any successful German penetrations. Uh, so in, in a sense that nothing happened is, in a, kind, is a kind of counterintelligence success. Um, actually, uh, the history of German espionage in World War II it, uh, in the United States is a, is a history of extremely uh, inept uh, operations. Um, for instance, the, uh, there was a German-American who uh, was, um, went back to Germany at the end of the 1930s who uh, German military intelligence recruited uh, and trained him as a radio operator to be the, uh, to head a, uh, 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 a shortwave radio station through which their American agents would send messages back to Germany. Um, he was identified by the FBI almost as soon as he arrived back in the United States, turned into a double agent, and essentially everything German uh, agents were providing to Germany went through his radio station, and the FBI decided what could and couldn't be sent. Uh, and it, of course, they identified the sources. So uh, uh, German espionage in, in World War II was, uh, in the United States was extremely unsuccessful. Now, from the point of view of counterintelligence, that's a big success. Uh, Soviet espionage was really not high on the radar of either Army counterintelligence or the FBI um, at this point uh, because they simply did not uh, regard the Soviets as a principal enemy at this point. Um, German uh, espionage was their, was their number one priority, followed uh, then in a kind of a tie between Japanese and Italian. Uh, the Soviets were in fourth place. Um, it was only at the end of the war that um, the massive counterintelligence operation that the FBI had put together during the war uh, 
was shifted from um, the German, principally the German, but also the Japanese and, and Italian targets, the whole thing was shifted toward the Soviet target, particularly when um, the uh, FBI realized in 1945 that Soviet espionage, it, it had been aware of some going on, there's no doubt about that, but it had not realized how extensive it had been. Um, they had only seen little bits of it. But a, a, one of the uh, KGB's principal liaison uh, agents, uh, Elizabeth Bentley, uh, defected in late 1945. Um, she had been uh, the liaison between KGB officers and quite literally scores of sources inside the American government. Um, the reason for that is, and this to go back to uh, uh, the history of Soviet uh, intelligence, in the 1930s, um, when the uh, KGB was initially establishing its operations in the United States, um, uh, it avoided using communists as sources because it believed, mistakenly, but it believed that the communist, the American Communist Party was probably infiltrated by the FBI. It wasn't at that time. Also, it believed, and this is certainly true, that if someone's an active communist uh, and they become a spy for us, um, if the FBI ever gets any hint, one of the first, you know, first people they're going to be looking at are communists. So better to get someone who's not a communist as an agent than someone who's a communist. So um, until the early 1940s, uh, the KGB would occasionally use uh, communists for certain tasks, uh, but they avoided recruiting them as sources. Uh, they did have, they had regular liaison with the American Communist Party and the American Communist Party was happy to cooperate particularly with providing false passports, um, uh, which Soviet agents could use, um, and providing safe houses, that is the various communists that would provide an apartment or a house where Soviet agents could meet with a, a source. But they avoided using them as sources in their own right, unless something just kind of was really terrific, then they might, might use it, but uh, it was not something they uh, liked to do. Well, then the, the trouble was, um, um, in the late uh, 1930s, uh, Soviet espionage in the United States um, was devastated. It was just, uh, it was ruined. Um, not by anything American counterintelligence did. Uh, Stalin ruined it. Uh, this was part of his internal purges. Uh, in 19, uh, starting in 1937, but continuing in really until 1940, um, uh, the KGB, or back then it had different nomenclature, NKVD and uh, other things, but the, uh, the KGB was purged, and a great many of its senior officers uh, were arrested and shot or sent to the gulag most of its senior officers in the United States who had developed uh, this fairly robust uh, industrial espionage apparatus were recalled to the Soviet Union and shot. Um, it got to the point that in, in uh, early 1941, um, there was only one experienced officer left. He had actually been about third or fourth in the hierarchy. He was now chief of the station because there was nobody else left. All of his bosses had been recalled and shot. Um, he had a few junior officers working for him. They had just arrived and they barely spoke English. Uh, so that, uh, and the number two guy uh, in the KGB station was actually part of the uh, KGB's, uh, originally as a part of their, you know, the Soviets do things differently from us. Um, the equivalent of the KGB of that era, it ran both internal Soviet security, which a huge apparatus, external intelligence, 
uh, and also border guard operations. Uh, the guy who was number two in the KGB station in 1941 was actually a border guard officer who had been sent over to uh, direct security at the 1939 World's Fair. The, the Soviets had an exhibit there, and of course they had security, and he was sent over to manage that, but then they kept him on as number two in the KGB uh, station because there wasn't anybody else. Well, you know, he was a border guard knuckle dragger. He wasn't a trained foreign intelligence officer, and one of his chief uh, instructions were to convince his boss to go back to Moscow so they could shoot him. Um, so things were at a low ebb uh, at this point, where then luckily for the chief of station, the FBI intervened. The FBI arrested him. Um, they had spotted him as an intelligence officer. He worked for Amtorg, that was his cover, the, the Soviet trading agency. And they figured he wasn't covered by diplomatic immunity. Um, so they arrested him, and Moscow re, you know, internally, reluctantly, decided, well, if the FBI is going to try to try him as a spy, he's probably not a traitor. Um, and then, you know, and then in the Japanese attack, we're, we become Soviet allies, and so we, even though he's been sitting in an American jail, okay, so he's, you know, we exchange him for some people in the Soviet Union. Um, wives of, of Americans who had returned to the Soviet Union. The Soviets wouldn't, wouldn't let out their Russian wives. Um, so he went back to Moscow and had a nice career in the, in the KGB. But that still left the American station with, uh, as an acting chief of uh, station, uh, this um, a border guard knuckle dragger uh, and a few junior officers. Uh, so the Soviets, now, now that we're in the war, and Stalin establishes uh, uh, the United States as a major target because they're allies. We have big opportunities. They're going to be one of the big industrial uh, sources of military stuff for the whole allied forces, and they're going to be a big deal after the war. So we need to have a robust industri uh, in espionage apparatus at work. Well, the KGB at that point had a choice. Um, they sent over a number of senior officers to get things going again. Now, if they had done it the way they would like to do, they would you know, start to develop some sources, bring in junior officers, train them, assimilate them to the American environment, and in four or five years, they would have, again, a really good espionage operation. Well, of course, this is 1942. Uh, the Germans are at the gates of Moscow. Um, the Kremlin and Stalin aren't going to put up with, we'll give you good intelligence in four or five years. Uh, they won't, he, he wants information now. All right, how are you going to find a whole bunch of willing American sources really, really quickly? Uh, and people who know other sources and so forth. So they decided to violate their previous policy. They turned wholesale to the American Communist Party. And there were a number of uh, party members who um, you know, were mid-levels, a few high-level uh, uh, positions in the American government. Um, and um, as we've discussed, a number of, of uh, scientists who wound up, and engineers wound up working in various military projects who were communist. Um, so the, um, uh, but to contact them, the KGB had to work through the Communist Party. And it, uh, it got some uh, and the party furnished high-level officials who would work with them. One well, was a guy named Jacob Golos, uh, who has an assistant, Elizabeth Bentley. Um, uh, Golos was actually a Russian, um, but he had lived in the United States most of his life. But uh, he was a good liaison with the KGB because uh, they trusted a fellow Russian uh, who was a communist. Elizabeth Bentley was totally American, uh, but she was Golos' uh, chief assistant, uh, also um, his lover. Uh, and Golos used uh, Bentley for, as sort of his liaison with a number of these communists, whom he was familiar with, who were then brought into espionage uh, through the Communist Party. Well, Golos died of a heart attack, uh, and then at pretty natural causes. Um, 
and Bentley took over as running all this apparatus. But um, we're, now t we're now into uh, 1945. Um, the KGB station has finally built up its own uh, officer network of good, of uh, trained KGB officers who now spoke good English, knew American customs, could get along with Americans without um, uh, scaring them or anything like that. Um, and they wanted to now professionalize things and eliminate amateurs like Elizabeth Bentley. So they were very grateful for what Golos had done and for Bentley for taking over the liaison with um, uh, and running the network that Golos had originally established again of scores of, uh, of communists in the government and elsewhere. They were very grateful to her, but they wanted her out. She wasn't Russian uh, and she was an amateur. So essentially they um, uh, thanked her and told her to uh, go have a very long vacation and they paid for it. Um, but um, thanks Elizabeth, but uh, you're out. She didn't take it well. Um, also she started to develop a drinking problem. Um, and she started to, uh, first she, she was very angry about being shoved out. Um, and she started to think the FBI was closing in on her. They weren't, but you know, it's the guilty flee when no man pursueth. Um, and she started to think the FBI was closing in, so she decided to strike first. She went to the FBI and said, here I am, and confessed to being a major Soviet spy. Well, it took them about a month or so to figure out whether this was a loon or a real Soviet spy. Um, but eventually they decided after they did some checking uh, that her story made sense um, and they started to follow up on it. Uh, and Hoover and the FBI realized uh, they had missed Soviet espionage that included dozens of, of American government officials, which is a bit of an embarrassment. But, as one of, but it's one of the reasons why the FBI, find, uh, when it, the war was over, changed its, uh, uh, its focus. Uh, on the Soviet uh, target. 